What's up, my dudes? This video is going to be a little different today. Uh, I have been out of sorts lately, one having to do with being called for jury duty. And the experience of that was something that I thought that you guys might be interested to learn more about. So if you are interested in learning what it is to do your, air quotes here, civic duty, then stick around, because maybe you'll find this one interesting. So the first thing that happens is you get this summon in the mail saying that you've been called to report for jury duty. Now on the number or on the ticket, there's a number that says your juror number X, Y, Z, whatever. Anywhere between one to like 500 apparently people can be called. You can check on the, web uh, on the websites to see whether or not they're going to keep you, by the way. So a couple of days before, you check to see whether or not they still need you to go in. Pretty, you know, fair to say that if you're in the later ranges, the 400 to 500 of my group got canceled, didn't have to go in. It's like, okay, but I still got to go in. So in the area that I'm in, and this is true of a lot of places, there's a criminal and a civil courthouse. I had to report to the criminal courthouse. You go there bright and early in the morning, 8 o'clock, and you walk into this room, funnel them with everybody else. They do all their security scans and everything. Now, from there, you end up watching a video with all the other potential jurors, and a judge will come out and eventually speak to you, let you know what the process is, thank you for your time for being there, and if you have any excuses of why you cannot be there for any reason, then he will hear you one by one, literally one person at a time. So that took us about another, I think, 30 or 40 minutes. And, yeah, pretty interesting. So, what ends up happening after all the people, you know, talk to the judge about why they can't be there, he most of the time lets them go, or he says something along the lines of, I'm not going to dismiss you outright, but you're going to be on call if they need you because of whatever reason. So, boom, there's that. <clears throat> From there, you get told which, you know, floor you're going to, floor one, floor two. And, yeah, they call your numbers out. It seems kind of random, but... We got called up to the third floor of a building, and we were told, you know, that we're going to be doing a criminal case. Now, we don't know anything about anything at this point, except for it is a criminal case. It's the state against the defendant. And eventually, you get walked into an actual courtroom. You've got a bunch of bailiffs. They're cops. And they kind of escort you all around the building, make sure you're safe. They put you into these booths, and then after that, the overflow area, all the different benches. Everyone sits down on those. So... After you sit down on all those, the judge comes out from his chambers and he talks a little bit about what the process is and he reads you a bunch of things like, oh, well, uh, make sure that you're honest, make sure you're truthful. And then he kind of gives you a scenario, a play-by-play -play of what his job is. And I thought that was interesting. The judge is basically a referee between the two sides. So if it's A versus B, he's acting as C and he lit um, not litigates, but he officiates between the two. So if you do something stupid, he calls you on that. If it's something that's not legal, not allowed, inadmissible, he calls them on that. So it was really interesting to learn that that is his role in this whole thing. He doesn't make any judgments in this case. He just makes sure that these two are being civil about what they're doing to each other, which was interesting. So the case that we got, we got a guy that decided to defend himself. This was back in 2019. He attempted to rob a house. At least that's what we were being told. But before we learned that, we were being questioned by both the prosecution and the defendant. We did learn the defendant at this time is defending himself, and they both asked very different questions. The prosecutor was asking us things like, do you feel sympathy for the defendant? Um, would you be okay if you know, I went hard on him because it is my job to prosecute him you know, by the state, like the state of Florida is prosecuting this man based on evidence. Are you willing to follow the evidence? They ask a bunch of questions. And then they pick seven jurors from there. So out of the 500 that started, 100 were immediately dismissed. Another probably 100 from going to talk to the judge. And then all the way down to a measly old seven. One of those seven is a substitute juror, basically. We, I got picked, <clears throat> so we ended up, you know, asking and answering all these questions and stuff. Some people get out of jury duty because they're like, I don't like our, I mean, I can't even imagine saying that to a judge. The guy was saying that he doesn't like our justice system and he thinks it's biased and he's basically barking at the judge about how he can't be there because he doesn't like him. And the judge took it on the chin and said, okay. So then the, you know, the next part, you walk out of the room and the prosecution and the defendant, they pick who they think gives them the best chance of winning, and they both have to agree to this. So seven jurors are picked. Um, only six are... We, we had seven people there because no one told the substitute she didn't have to show up, but she was there. And then they let you know and they call you out. Here's what time you have to come back. Okay, so <clears throat> all of that is kind of the pre-work to the fact that you're getting picked to be a juror on a criminal case. Now, 
a little bit of advice. This is not legal advice. This is personal advice. If you guys ever find yourself in a situation where you need a, an attorney, please, for the love of God, get yourself one. This defendant defended himself, and I don't know why, but public defenders are better than no defenders. They're there to give you legal counsel. So before I give away anything else, I'm just going to let you guys know that the best thing you can do if you're in this situation where there is criminal proceedings against you is to get help of some form. If you cannot afford an attorney, they will gift you one. Even if you think that attorney is no good, it is way better than defending yourself. Okay, so we get told, go home, and exactly when to come back, and the whole process begins all over again. Now, this time it's a little bit different. We're taken into a waiting area, and then we have the largest bailiff I think I've ever seen. He was easily six foot five and probably 260 pounds, just flat out muscular dude. And he was the small one. The other one that had us in the other room to protect us must have been six foot eight. Now, I don't know what these guys are eating and drinking, but my God, dude, like, pretty sure he could have picked us up and piggybacked us all the way upstairs if he chose to do that. Pretty cool. Anyway, so we get taken up. They're all perfectly nice. We're told and shown exactly where we're going to be deliberating everything and that we're under like a lockdown area. And each of those areas are protected by a bailiff. So if someone is in the front, someone's in the back. And then, you know, we go to the area, we get to basically pick out lunch for later. So we get this sign-in sheet like, hey, here's what I want for lunch today. And they buy you all that and they give you lunch, which is pretty cool. Now, next, you go into the court and you sit down, you have a notepad. The judge goes through the process of everything, explains everything that might be relevant, gives you definitions and details of what to expect throughout the day. And then from there, the prosecution and the defendant have a chance to give their opening statements. So the prosecution literally laid out word for word exactly what she was going to do. And I mean exact. She said, here's exactly what we have. Here's how we found it. Here's the amount of witnesses I plan to call today. Here is why this person is guilty. And I'm going to prove this to you without a shadow of a doubt. It was, it was like if I was watching a PowerPoint presentation that got over within two minutes of exactly key points. Cool. So I wrote all that down in my little notepad that they gave me. Which, by the way, you're not allowed to take the notepad home. They actually burn the notes that you take. So there's no nothing identifying in your part whatsoever of the notes that you took. So, okay. Defendant gets up, and he rambles on for 25 minutes. He literally, it just reminded me of, like, if you went to your grandfather's house and you haven't seen him for a while, he was going to talk to you about nothing. But we happen to be in a criminal case. So, <laughs> uh, his defense, from what I could tell, was we should also follow the evidence because he thinks there is none. That was his defense. And we've got the prosecution saying, here's what we found. Here's exactly how we found it. Here's people that can prove the legitimacy of all of this. And the defendant telling us within 25 minutes uh, about how that is not evidence that indicates him whatsoever and that we should not follow it, even though it's evidence. To, I don't know. It was very, very strange. Like his opening statement was all over the place. So two hours go in. We are listening to the opening arguments. We listen to the prosecution basically show evidence from everything that had happened. He was caught on a Ring One camera uh, trying to get into somebody's house. All he did, by the way, was he looked into a window, and then he jiggled the door handle. He didn't pull it hard. He touched it once with a small pull, then he got back on his bike, and he drove off. That's all he did. That is a crime of attempted burglary of a dwelling. And I know that because the prosecution explained it clearly. <laughs> So, anyway, after that, the defense gets up, he gives his piece, tells us all these things about how the Ring 1 camera doesn't indicate him, doesn't look like him at all, and yeah, yada, yada, yada. So, what I learned from that is that there are things within the Ring 1 that can be distorted, but if you have an expert come in and tell you exactly how these things work, and why it is what it is, and that he's looking at the person right there, and he's the one that took the screenshots and took the video and literally coordinated the effort to find this person particularly, and he's been doing this for 15 years. I was like, well, there you go. So the long and the short of it, after everything was all said and done, we knew this guy was guilty by lunchtime, but because he was rambling on every time he got up there to speak, and the judge only allowed this in the beginning parts of the day, he stopped allowing it eventually because... I mean, it's not fair to anybody, I guess, but um, with the prosecution hat, his sweater was very unique. His walking gait, which I think that's why I was there. She knew I was a personal trainer. She specifically asked me that. And I look at walking and running gait patterns literally for a living. When I saw him walk and then I saw the ring cam footage, it was absolutely nailed right there for me already. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's definitely him. 
Um, everything from where he was, the time of day that he was there, exactly what he was wearing, how many people saw him, multiple different cameras, one from Publix, one from Starbucks, the bike that he had, even a cop, by the way. Um, she found a officer's body cam footage talking to him wearing that same exact sweater in that same exact area. She proved that he lived there. Uh, literally, everything was wrapped up in a nice little bow. And the only thing the defense could tell us was that it wasn't him. So, you know, long story made short, get yourself a public defender. <laughs> anyway, at the end of all of this, we found the guy guilty. And there's something they could do. Um, I didn't know this, but the defense can poll you. And he asked each one of you to say how you voted. Because it needs to be unanimous. All of us need to agree that this person was guilty. So all of us said yes. That got a little bit awkward. Before we came in to give our official verdict... I mean, yeah, we went to the back room, we talked about it a little bit, but we all knew. But we wanted to make sure it was as official as possible. So we talked through all of our notes individually. It took us about an hour to go through each and every key point, And we actively tried to find something to defend this guy with because he wasn't really defending himself. I don't know what he was doing. It seemed like he was there just to waste time. But we went through different defense points and everything, and the only real defense we could come up with was the fact that there was no fingerprints on the scene. Even though the door was dusted, no fingerprints came about. Um, we happen to have a juror that knows a lot about that uh, from a previous case that they were on, and, you know, they explained it. I forget exactly what the details are, but they explained it. So from there, uh, you know, pick your foreman. The foreman gives the, the verdict. This person is guilty. And then, yeah, you have a bunch of bailiffs in there to make sure that the guy doesn't run off the covering every exit. As soon as you give your verdict, the judge thanks you for your time, tells you, thank you for doing your civic duty. We really appreciate it. And then you are escorted by security out. And I'm talking like all the way to the parking garage that you parked in. He even stopped traffic to walk us across the street. So that was the long and the short of this experience. And if I can give you one bit of advice, whether you're guilty or not, um, it does come down to what they can prove. And you, for the love of God, get a public defender. Because this prosecution, literally within the first two minutes of her opening statement, said exactly what she was going to do, and then she did it. It was at this point that I realized why she was asking us if we'd have any sympathy for the defendant. Because the education between the two different sides was very clear and evident that one person did their job clearly, effectively, and the other person was kind of grasping at straws, and it does make you feel bad for them. It doesn't change the fact that they did commit the crime that they did or that they were being accused of, but sometimes you vote a certain way based on your conscience, maybe your bias, and you do want to feel sympathy for this individual because, I mean, the prosecution basically ripped him to shreds. It wasn't even close. Anyway, uh, if you guys found this one interesting, let me know. If not, that's okay too. I'll see you in the next one.